Good morning, everybody. My name is Caleb Aridano. I'm a senior McConnell Scholar, and I currently serve as the chair of the McConnell Scholars Program. This morning, we are joined by Kevin Rudd, who currently serves as the Australian Ambassador to the United States. Ambassador Rudd has also served as Prime Minister of Australia from 2007 to 2010, and then again in 2013. Prior to his tenure as Prime Minister, Ambassador Rudd served as a member for Griffith in the Australian Parliament from 1998 to 2013. Aside from his storied career in politics, Ambassador Rudd is also one of the world's foremost experts on China and Chinese affairs. Earning his PhD at Oxford University last year, Ambassador Rudd's dissertation was entitled China's New Marxist Nationalism, Defining Xi Jinping's Ideological Worldview. Additionally, in 2020, he was appointed President and CEO of the Asia Society globally, and in 2022, he founded the, Society, or he founded the Asia Society Policies Institute Center for China Analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming, from his Commonwealth to ours, Ambassador Kevin Rudd. Uh, can you all hear me up the back? Good. And any simultaneous translation needed for Australian English? <laughs> okay, we'll work on it. I've got to say, you're the best dressed uh, bunch of students I've ever addressed anywhere in the world as well. <laughs> Apart from the first group that's ever stood up for when I've entered the room. So, uh, you're very well mannered here in, uh, in Louisville. It's good to be here at uh, the McConnell Centre and in the Elaine Chow Auditorium. I've known Mitch and Elaine for a very long time. And uh, he asked me to come and uh, speak here quite a, t quite a number of years ago. I didn't think back then that I'd end up as Australia's ambassador to the United States. So I was, uh, I've been in Kentucky since yesterday, out at Henderson. Any of you know where Henderson is? Good. Any of you from Henderson? Okay, we'll have to rectify that for next time around. <laughs> uh, and uh, took the drive to Louisville uh, last night. And I uh, must admit, it's been... Um, uh, a great time to see something of this, uh, this beautiful city on the banks of a, of a mighty river. Um, Mitch McConnell has also been a uh, great supporter uh, of uh, the US-Australia alliance. Uh, Mitch, uh, as you know, is a graduate of this university, I think from memory, from 1964, um, which is um, back in the Mesolithic period. Uh, and uh, and uh, that was about the time I was um, still in short pants, uh, but sort of thinking about what I would do. I grew up on a farm in rural Australia. Any of you come from a farming background? Good, good to see. And uh, I chose at an early age uh, when my father asked me whether my career futures lay in beef or dairy uh, to pursue China instead. Uh, so a future career in animal husbandry, while attractive, uh, I thought I would leave to one side. But Mitch's support for the US-Australia alliance is important, uh, not least because uh, it is one of uh, America's oldest continuing alliances. Uh, we've been in the trenches with each other effectively uh, since uh, the First World War, more than 100 years. In fact, every major conflict uh, you and the United States have been engaged in since then, uh, we've usually been in the foxholes next to you. Um, uh, whether it's uh, the First War, the Second War, Korea, uh, Vietnam, First Iraq War, Second Iraq War, Afghanistan, and I've probably missed some on the way through. So we know each other well. Um, our militaries know each other well. Um, and uh, they have served in multiple theatres, both naval, air and land, across uh, the centuries. In fact, my hometown of Brisbane in Australia uh, was uh, General MacArthur's garrison town from which he conducted the Pacific War uh, after his retreat from the Philippines. Think of a, a town like uh, Louisville. Uh, Brisbane back then uh, had a population of 350,000 and then 800,000 Americans arrived. It kind of changed the dynamics of the town. My mother used to tell me stories of this. So uh, we're proud of our long-standing association with the United States through our alliance structure and are proud to have been one of your closest and continuing allies over more than a century. In fact, in the whole spectrum of that history, uh, today marks the second anniversary of an agreement called AUKUS. AUKUS, standing for Australia, United Kingdom, United States, uh, was framed uh, and announced uh, two years ago between our two countries. Uh, it was uh, given uh, shape and effect by a declaration 
uh, at San Diego in March of this year between President Biden and uh, Prime Minister Albanese and Prime Minister Sunak of the United Kingdom. And now the legislation uh, to give AUKUS legislative effect is now before the United States Congress and we hope to see its passage by year's end. This is a significant milestone and for those of you not familiar with it, AUKUS essentially does two things. One, for the first time in our military history, Australia will now move to acquire and develop uh, nuclear powered submarines. Uh, this is a large development. Uh, we've not taken the decision um, casually, but because of the radically changed strategic circumstances in our own region, we see this as necessary as contributing not only to our own national security, but also to our broader strategy of deterrence in the Indo-Pacific region. The other pillar of AUKUS uh, is equally important. It aims to create beyond uh, uh, nuclear boats and nuclear propulsion technology and the construction of nuclear powered vessels uh, in Adelaide in South Australia. It seeks to create also for the first time a seamless Australia, US, UK defence science and technology industry. This is quite a breakthrough. But given our radically changed global and regional strategic circumstances, our governments have decided that it's time that we actually did this. Uh, we can no longer afford to operate on the basis of um, localised, balkanised, separate uh, defence science and technology uh, establishments. This country is enormously innovative. The Brits are innovative and uh, we are innovative as well. And there are a whole bunch of platforms uh, which we've developed in Australia, which we'd like to then co-develop with you in the United States. From unarmed uh, aerial vehicles through to new ranges of radar and the rest, which we've honed and tuned in our part of the world. So it's the next and logical step uh, after we established Five Eyes uh, back in 1946 to share our most uh, deeply classified national security information with each other and intelligence information to create this seamless uh, defense science and technology uh, ecosystem between our three countries. And that's the second part of AUKUS, uh, which will work its way through the House and the Senate, uh, barring some of the peculiarities of the United States legislative process, which I've observed, shutdowns and the rest, um, by year's end. I've been asked today to speak about our broader uh, geostrategic circumstances, uh, our response as allies and partners to those changes uh, and to reflect for a moment on the future. Then I thought, uh, subject uh, to the Senate Director's views, I'll shut up and open it to a general conversation, if that's okay with you guys. First of all, how many of you uh, are uh, in uniform and uh, are participating in this as a graduate program from your various arms of the armed forces of the United States? Good. Well, thank you for your service and uh, all that you're doing. I understand you're mid-career officers. Uh, looking by your faces and age, you look uh, almost as young as I do. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I certainly uh, salute your continued service, proudly wearing the uniform of the United States. Uh, how many of you are undergraduates who have come from uh, other parts of uh, Kentucky to study here or beyond Kentucky? Good to see you all. And uh, how many of you from outside of Kentucky? Good. Where are you from? Canada. My God, did you get lost or something? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Whereabouts in Canada? Um, New Brunswick. Wow, you're from Eastern Canada. Yes. You're almost from Anne of Green Gables territory over right. that way. <laughs> so uh, um, it's uh, welcome to uh, the, uh, our Canadian friends. But from the Commonwealth of uh, Australia to the Commonwealth of Kentucky, I extend my felicitous greetings to you all. Firstly, how is our strategic environment changing? Um, as uh, the Senate Director indicated before, I've been a lifelong student of China. Uh, I began studying Chinese on my first week of university uh, back in the Neolithic period. Uh, if uh, Mitch was Mesolithic, I'm Neolithic. Um, uh, in 1976, and so that was the year that Mao was still alive. Uh, the year that uh, he died, that uh, Zhou Enlai died, uh, and that the Gang of Four was purged, and Deng Xiaoping came back to power. It was a momentous year. And as an 18-year-old who knew nothing about anything, 
Uh, I've got to say it opened my eyes to this unfolding uh, geopolitic di geopolitical dynamism to Australia's north, uh, which was the emergence of a new type of China after the tumult of the Cultural Revolution between 66 and 76. Um, I completed my studies after five years of learning modern Chinese language, classical Chinese language and uh, Chinese history, did my dissertation work on human rights and dissent in China. And then, um, uh, because I was essentially unemployable in those days, because those skills were not in any demand anywhere in the world, um, I then heard that there was this place called the Foreign Service that I should apply to. So I became an Australian Foreign Service officer. And as one of their better Chinese linguists, they then chose to send me to Sweden, uh, <laughs> which uh, didn't even have a good Chinese restaurant in those days, uh, <laughs> let, let alone could they speak any Chinese. But eventually I was cross-posted to Beijing and my job in our embassy in Beijing, having spent short stints in Taipei, Shanghai and Hong Kong before that, um, uh, was to analyse Chinese internal politburo politics. So that's kind of my core craft. Uh, when I later slid down the food chain of life into electoral politics, um, down not up, the, um, uh, I uh, have always had China as a continuing focus of my engagement uh, with the region and with the world. So for my sins, I have met uh, uh, Chinese leaders uh, since Deng uh, to the present, and having met Xi Jinping a number of times as well, and had uh, multiple conversations uh, with him. Uh, that's my background, uh, and uh, that's why I wish to focus on China in large part in our discussion this morning, and it forms the basis upon which our current Australian Prime Minister uh, has uh, asked me to come to Washington to be uh, US uh, Ambassador to the United States. So, what are the strategic change drivers uh, in the Indo-Pacific region? Three, as I would see it. Number one, that China's aggregate national power has now grown sufficiently and grown sufficiently rapidly to now begin rivaling that of the United States across all the indices of power, whether we're talking about military power, whether we're talking about economic power, whether we're talking about trade power, whether we're talking about investment power, whether we're talking about technology power, um, and increasingly in the ideational or ideological domain as well. China, to use the, the literature which, uh, and the language which the United States now uses, has become the pacing challenge for the United States. And uh, the Chinese uh, calculate these things carefully. Any of you are students of Chinese language? The Chinese have an expression called zonghe guoli, which means aggregate or comprehensive national power. Where the Chinese, in the tradition of the Soviet Union, uh, and what was used to be called in the days of the Cold War, uh, when they calculated what was called the correlation of forces, aggregate their adversaries, their opponents, and their competitors, total drivers of national power, into a formula. And they've been concluding for some time now that they're drawing close to the United States. It is the material change in the balance of power, both objectively as seen um, by analysts around the world, but most critically as subjectively seen by the Chinese leadership, which creates the first and fundamental change dynamic. The second is this. Uh, the second uh, is that uh, since Xi Jinping and his assumption of national leadership uh, at the 18th Party Congress at the end of 2012, now more than a decade ago, uh, that China's intentionality beyond its capability set, changing capability set, has also been changing. Summarised most uh, succinctly, Deng Xiaoping's uh, aphorism for 35 years for China's strategy in the world was summed up in what is called Deng's Diplomatic Principles, uh, a series of reflections he made, uh, in fact, in the early 90s. And the phrase is as follows, hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. Uh, and it's an aphorism in Chinese language drawn from the classics, Tao Guang Yang Hui Jue Bo And so, this formed a guiding principle for China's uh, strategic behavior for the decades. 
Its underpinning logic was clear. Deng assumed that given China's state of national impoverishment economically and near financial bankruptcy at the end of the Cultural Revolution in 1976, that it would take generations for China to rebuild uh, its economic power. And when asked once uh, how long would this process take, uh, Deng said dozens of generations, tens of generations. And so Chinese generations are measured in similar length of time to those in the West, uh, in the US and the rest. Uh, and that means a period of some hundreds of years. And so in other words, both the Chinese domestically and uh, the international community engaging China through that period of time became familiar with and comfortable with a China which was prioritizing its economic development not seeking to assume a position of leadership in the region and the world, and beyond that simply wanted to get to the stage over some hundreds of years of modernizing its economy and lifting its people out of poverty, which they have done most spectacularly. Uh, some 700, Chinese, 700 million Chinese peasants and workers have been lifted from near subsistence levels of income uh, to become a low middle income country in the world and is until recently the world's most populous country, that is no mean achievement. But that was what was the orthodoxy prior to Xi Jinping's ascension. Since Xi Jinping's ascension, uh, we saw at the Central Foreign Affairs Work Conference of the party in November of uh, 2014, not long after he took over, a little less than a decade ago, him turn this Deng Xiaoping orthodoxy on its head. And he said, that was for the China that was. Now we are a China proud and loud, loud and proud of our national power. It is time for us to, to use the Chinese, Chinese term, strive for achievement, fen fai your way. And this axiomatic and uh, conceptual change in China's strategic posture gave rise to this new period of Chinese activity in the world characterized by increasing levels of Chinese foreign policy assertiveness and increasing levels of Chinese security policy assertiveness uh, in the region and in the world. And most spectacularly characterized in recent years by what's become known across the world as China's wolf warrior diplomacy. Another Chinese term, Zhan Lang Wai Jiao. Uh, if you've not seen the Chinese movie, Wolf Warrior, have a look. Uh, it's basically how you see Top Gun through a Chinese lens. And guess what? The Chinese win. And they basically save all your collective bacon. Um, in other words, it is uh, the world seen through an entirely different lens. And so this change in Chinese intentionality um, was clear cut in 14. The unfolding of it and the manifestation of it is pretty clear to see. Uh, the China's island reclamation campaign in the South China Sea really began to unfold from about that time in 14 and 15 and into early 16 um, prior to the 2016 US presidential election. Despite Xi Jinping's assurances on the White House lawn and his meeting with President Obama that none of these reclamations would result in their militarization, of course they've become comprehensively militarized. But it's not just there. Uh, it's not just in terms of China's uh, island reclamation in the South China Sea. Uh, it is also China now asserting a different posture in terms of how it deals with other territorial challenges from its neighboring states. The East China Sea, disputed territories with Japan in Sankoku and Diaoyudao, historically called the Ryukus. Uh, also, of course, on, along the Sino-Indian border where there have been multiple disputes. Even uh, small territorial disputes uh, with uh, disputed offshore islands with the Republic of Korea. But most spectacularly, of course, with China's unconcluded, yet to be concluded, national historical mission as seen through the lens of the Chinese Communist Party of reclaiming Taiwan and returning it formally to Chinese sovereignty. And so in each of these military domains, in each of these geopolitical domains, China has moved from a passive position to an active, assertive, and from the lens of other regional countries, aggressive posture. So the intentionality of uh, Chinese uh, strategy has changed. And beyond the Indo-Pacific, we see this also at play in China's wider global diplomacy. 
the unfolding of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in Beijing in 2016, the unfolding of a range of other Sinocentric institutions, uh, such as the most recent and spectacular evolution of the BRICS, uh, historically made up of just five countries, um, Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, China, uh, India and South Africa. And now, as you've seen through the most recently convened um, conference uh, in Pretoria, uh, with another five or six added, including, most spectacularly, two of the Gulf monarchies, the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, historically close allies of the United States. And then beyond those things again, uh, you see China also creating and constructing international institutions and norms beyond the UN and beyond the Bretton Woods framework, which was laid down by the victor countries uh, coming out of World War II in 1944-45. At a combination of the Bretton Woods Conference in 44 and the San Francisco Conference in 45. And what China is articulating in the world is the fact that um, these uh, institutions and new norms associated with it reflected in what Xi Jinping calls the Global Civilization Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, are slowly but surely seeking to obtain normative status in various international institutions, uh, being quietly, effectively and sometimes successfully inserted into the normative language of UN and other international deliberative institutions to change the underpinning value structure, normative structure, and, and institutional structure of the wider international system. So, from one single phrase in 2014, proceeds a cornucopia of political, geopolitical, and geoeconomic activity. That's the second major change driver. The third I would uh, draw your attention to is the fact that from 2017 on, uh, the United States and its allies have decided to push back and push back in a fundamental and comprehensive fashion. H.R. McMaster, the then National Security Advisor under the Trump administration, uh, developed the new National Security Strategy of the United States, which was released in November of um, 17 which said that the age of strategic engagement between China and the United States was over. We had now entered into a new period of strategic competition, whether we in America or we in the world like it or not. In other words, the deep analytical conclusion in the United States uh, and in allied capitals around the world was that China was not just asserting uh, its interests and values with its neighboring states, with the wider Indo-Pacific region and the broader international community, but beyond that again uh, was um, uh, now seeking to supplant the previous dominant presence of the United States and its allies in the immediate theater, in the wider Indo-Pacific region, and as the underpinning power for the global rules-based order. And so it's worth studying carefully what H.R. McMaster had to say in that seminal document. And the remarkable thing as a foreign observer of your domestic political process is whether you vote R or whether you vote D. Uh, and I notice we're in a red state which now currently has a Democratic governor and Mitch McConnell is a Republican. So I understand where we are in terms of the widespread of US domestic politics. But from an allied perspective, what has been good is the fact that the orthodoxy outlined by H.R. McMaster at the end of 17 has essentially become bipartisan policy here in the United States as reflected both by the administration and by the political dynamics of the United States Congress. And so this is um, an important development. And since that time, we've seen the United States not just as a series of declaratory statements such as the one we've had in November of 17, but progressively across its strategy for uh, Taiwan, its partnership with its allies in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the emergence of new institutions such as AUKUS, new institutions such as the Quad uh, at summit level, new institutions such as the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, new sub-institutional relations such as the recently convened trilateral summit between the ROK, Japan and the United States at Camp David just a couple of weeks ago. 
uh, together with a new forward leaning strategy among the Pacific Island countries as well. So therefore, what we see is an unfolding pattern of diplomatic and security policy activity. And beyond that, in terms of American economic diplomacy, a new strategy of de-risking, not decoupling, the United States and allied economies from critical dependence uh, on China, whether that is in categories of high technology, such as semiconductors, uh, artificial intelligence and quantum computing, or whether it is in the provision of critical minerals uh, to the United States and to allies around the world. Given all of our collective experiences of what happened, frankly, in the giant global wake-up call called COVID, uh, when global supply chains was, were significantly and sufficiently constrained and redirected. And by and large, the United States uh, has brought its allies along with us in this overall strategic uh, redirection. So if I'm asked what's caused the change, why is this world which looked reasonably comfortable a decade ago or so, Putin hadn't done his first number in uh, Ukraine, he hadn't certainly done his second number in Ukraine, um, things were rocky from time to time with China but by and large on questions of trade and trade related diplomacy plus human rights, to a decade later uh, where we now find ourselves in a fundamentally competitive uh, arrangement. Those are the three change drivers I wanted to draw to your attention. Finally, before we open this to a conversation, um, could I say this? I'm just looking at my time. Yeah, Because um, we're about halfway through our allocated time. Uh, what are the two most salient uh, features uh, of this, uh, of this uh, US and allied strategic response? The core one is US strategy of deterrence towards China over Taiwan. The reason that is so important is because Xi Jinping has made it plain that he intends, if he can, to return Taiwan to Chinese sovereignty, if possible, during his own political lifetime. And so with Xi Jinping, uh, what has he done to give evidence of that? He's issued a directive to the Chinese PLA back in 2015. Uh, to be fully reorganized as a military in new sets of military regions which give greater focus and lens to a uh, Taiwan amphibious operation by 2027. China has shrunk its military regions from seven down to five, sought to create an integrated command structure in order to create for the first time genuinely joint operations between Plan PLAF and the PLA, People's Liberation Army, People's Liberation Navy and People's Liberation Air Force. Plan PLAF and PLA. Um, and to do so with fully integrated lo logistics and what he describes as fully, quote, informationized, unquote, warfare. <coughs> Given the history of the PLA, this has been nothing short of a minor revolution. The PLA's history has largely been that of a land force and largely been directed for the purposes of maintaining the party's control within the country. This fundamental strategic retasking in terms of China's ambitions for Taiwan is something we should all focus on. Number two is that if you look carefully at the statements of the Taiwan Affairs Office of the Party Central Committee, what's called in Chinese the Taiban, um, the director has indicated that Taiwan should return to China's territorial uh, uh, embrace and political sovereignty quote, in the new era, another Chinese term, Xin Shidai. Xin Shidai is a term new era is co-definitional with the Xi Jinping period. And then thirdly, having been a politician myself, guess what? Politicians tend to like to conclude things when they're in office. And so for him to be able to return Taiwan to Chinese sovereignty uh, would therefore place him in the Chinese Communist Party pantheon on a status equivalent to Mao given Mao's achievement at uni in uniting China under CCP rule back in 1949, after effectively more than a century of internal disunity. So the sense of political mission and political history which political leaders can have is the third evidence piece. So the dynamics of deterrence against China and Xi Jinping in particular over Taiwan 
with the objective of causing Xi Jinping and the CMC, the Central Military Commission, to wake up each morning and say, it's still too risky. Um, that is the central objective of deterrence. Whether it's uh, to be achieved at the military level by the United States, the military level on the part of uh, US allies, both in, um, both in uh, the Indo-Pacific and uh, in theaters beyond, or in terms of the military capabilities of the Taiwanese themselves, given they would be on the front line by definition of any Chinese action, either by way of blockade, by way of territorial invasion, or by way of direct cyber attack. But beyond uh, military capability and military preparedness and military deterrence in all of its departments and domains lies China's continuing calculus of political will, that is the capacity and predisposition of the United States and its allies uh, to act. Because if that disappears, erodes and corrodes, and then uh, the Chinese calculus would be whatever capabilities have been assembled, the United States or its allies would not be predisposed to deploy them. The third element of deterrence is broadly economic. What economic damage could China's leadership uh, conclude would flow to, its, um, flow to itself as a consequence of taking unilateral military action uh, in order to resolve a long-standing territorial dispute? What would be the scale and dimension of international sanctions, the scale and dimension of trade sanctions, the scale and dimension of financial sanctions, the scale and dimension of uh, investment sanctions. What would be the deterrent anticipation of that prior to the event? And what would be their calculation of the political likelihood of that being achieved? And the final element of deterrence is what I would describe as foreign policy deterrence. And that is, uh, how would Chinese calculate that their international brand would be fundamentally torpedoed, damaged, or otherwise impaired in the eyes of the international community by taking such an action against Taiwan, which would inevitably result in huge loss of life and property. And that is why China's diplomacy in part can be explained across the rest of the international community, to cause the rest of the international community to conclude that such an action is quite different from Ukraine, Taiwan is not an independent nation state, Ukraine is. This is unfinished national business in terms of China's reunification. Uh, every country in the world establishing diplomatic rec uh, recognition of Beijing has had to reach one form of accommodation or another with the so-called one China policy. And if this is reinforced by an economic diplomacy across the world saying it's fundamentally in your economic interests, your trade interests and your investment interests and your BRI interests not to get in the road, uh, then that is China's objective as well. So I conclude with this, that therefore the dynamics of deterrence, uh, as I've just described, in all of its sub-dimensions, therefore therein lies the essential determinant, in my analysis, of whether the decade ahead remains peaceful or whether it is not. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I think we have time for um, some questions. So who would like to kick us off? Good morning, Ambassador. Catherine um, Where are you from, Catherine? Uh, I am from uh, Missouri. I'm stationed in Missouri. Good, good. You're in the military? Yes, sir. Um, Rachel. Yes, sir. Yeah, doing what? Uh, I'm a OSIC commander. That is really sensitive. <laughs> what um, is an OSIC so commander? I, I am in charge of basic training and job training for military police, um, get, soldiers who Oh, come I see. In. You get these people to get fit. Is that right? Yes, yes. We help them get, My we God. turn them into soldiers. Just advise me to steer clear of you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds painful. Oh, it's not that bad, sir. <laughs> um, you mentioned a little bit uh, with your third point of deterrence, but with China's growing aggregate power in the region, has Australia faced or anticipate a backlash or reprisals from China due to the orcas? And if that's a little too sensitive, what are some of the second and third order effects that Australia kind of anticipates when this gets passed or if sure. it gets passed? Well, one of the greatest barometers of the um, strategic benefit of, uh, of orcas to Australia uh, and to uh, the United States, and frankly for the wider strategic stability of the Indo-Pacific, can be measured by the volume of the Chinese reaction. Um, and I call it the volumometer. 
the, uh, uh, when the volumometer is uh, ra ranging at zero, you can basically say, yeah, it's kind of got a meh effect in Beijing. Do you have the word meh in American English? <laughs> okay. That's not just an Australianism? Okay. My kids introduce me to meh, and uh, <laughs> usually when I seek to give them strong moral encouragement to do something, meh. And um, so the meh factor uh, from the Chinese is usually reflected in zero response. Uh, the volume res volumetric response to AUKUS has been, I would say, on the Richter scale of zero to ten, uh, if we're equating it with an earthquake, about 7.2. So in other words, noticeable, a bit of rumbling around the edges, but no buildings falling down. Um, so I take it that our Chinese friends are not happy about it. Um, but uh, when I've said to Chinese interlocutors that if you're a country such as Australia, with uh, one of the largest coastlines in the world, um, with the third largest exclusive economic zone, EEZ, sorry, EEZ, uh, uh, do you say Z or Z in Canada, by the way? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, um, in the world, uh, that it makes sense, if you're the government of Australia, to have enhanced naval capabilities to protect uh, your sovereignty and to protect your territorial integrity. So, uh, and sovereign states under the United Nations, under the UN Charter, we're perfectly entitled to make whatever security arrangements we like. Um, and uh, short of a violation of Article 2, which is what uh, Vladimir Putin did recently, and, and invade another member state of the United States and violate their territorial integrity. So I suspect that um, um, this therefore has registered in Beijing because it, at the core of it lies a formidable set of capabilities when you're looking at, at uh, nuclear propulsion and nuclear propelled submarines and all of the inherent strategic advantages which they possess. Secondly, China has also evidenced in the past that when it is particularly displeased, uh, it will use uh, the tools of economic uh, coercion and, and economic statecraft. For example, uh, when the previous Australian government, uh, after the outbreak of COVID-19, stated that there should be an independent international investigation into the origins of COVID, uh, the Chinese then instituted some $40 billion worth of trade sanctions on Australia almost immediately. And uh, many of those still remain in place almost three years later. So that's a further evidence of Chinese being dis displeased. But the final point I'd make in terms of Australia's economic and political resilience is that the posture that we've adopted, uh, parallel to the perceptions here in this country, about the necessary ingredients of China strategy are largely bipartisan. There are disagreements at the edges, but not at the center. Um, and furthermore, China's uh, campaign of economic coercion uh, against Australia uh, it was a spectacular failure because A, it brought together all sides of Australian politics uh, when uh, they concluded that this was um, uh, an inappropriate response from Beijing and B, um, Australia became the poster child in the world for how to deal with economic coercion if you're a US ally elsewhere. Whether you're Lithuania, whether you're the Republic of Korea, whether you're um, uh, other countries that are experiencing uh, the blunt edge of Chinese economic statecraft. So I think uh, we're capable of navigating this in the future. Uh, and we also have a reasonable sense of humor as well. Mm -hmm. Australians, that is. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Good morning, sir. Um, so I am Chief Warrant Officer 3, Victoria Ramage Garcia. So I'm also in the military, hitting about 19 years. Uh, Good, you're having fun? Yes, well, I stayed in that long. <laughs> so it's been fun enough. <laughs> um, and I'm currently stationed in Maryland oh, uh, here. And so my question that I have is, so I read that Australia is pursuing a new strategy to build critical minerals uh, processing industry and that the biggest challenge so far is the financing. So my question then is, is what steps is the Australian government taking to circumvent or restrict Chinese investment, whether directly or indirectly, to include uh, Chinese front companies? Good. Well, a deeply acute question, which if I was normally in the business of Australian domestic politics, I would duck and weave around. <laughs> so, and I'm sure no American politician engages in duck and weave uh, <laughs> and, uh, and avoiding answering the question. So let me try and answer it head on, uh, as bluntly as I can, given that I'm being live streamed to who knows where. 
uh, uh, probably Nanjing. Um, um, the, uh, it's along these lines. What's the problem? The problem uh, in the world is that we've identified really over the last decade uh, since the Chinese imposed uh, rare earths bans against Japan as uh, punishment for Japan uh, declaring uh, or purchasing as the government uh, the islands at the centre of the um, uh, East China Sea dispute, which were previously held in private hands. The Chinese then decided that a form of appropriate punishment was to suspend rare earth sales to Japan. And by that stage, rare earths had become a near Chinese processing monopoly already. That sent the first flare up into the sky, even though subsequently the Chinese relaxed those bans. Uh, more broadly though, in the post-COVID experience, when we've become much more acutely conscious of our vulnerability to exposed international supply chains, the world has now focused on uh, the relevance of critical minerals across the board. How many critical minerals are there in the world? Don't worry, I didn't know until about a month ago. Uh, 86, okay. Uh, I can name maybe four or five. Um, I failed junior chemistry at high school. Uh, so uh, it was, well, I didn't, do, I didn't fail, but I didn't do so well. The um, periodic table it was used to throw me, you know. What the hell was that? You know? <laughs> when have you last used the periodic table? And uh, anyway, it's something we should all know. Uh, I'm, once someone tells me why. Um, the, uh, is that uh, critical minerals such as lithium, absolutely central to batteries, uh, absolutely central therefore to electric vehicles, absolutely central to how we're seeking to decarbonize the world. Uh, but not just lithium, and batteries are used of course more broadly beyond uh, EVs. Uh, but others such as cobalt, uh, others such as nickel, uh, others such as the, uh, what we broadly call rare earths. Um, guess what? Your friend, uh, reliable ally and partner in Australia, because we are, uh, have been a giant quarry for the last 150 years, uh, we have all of this stuff. We're the world's largest producer of lithium and either the first, second or third largest producers of the other ones I've just mentioned. The question lies, however, and your question goes to processing, not simply uh, the possession of the resources. And what we did in, the, in recent times was, and prior to these tensions, geopolitical tensions with China arising, uh, was allow some Chinese investment into the Australian mining industry, but frankly not a decisive presence. As Prime Minister, I remember actually blocking a number of these applications of quite significant proposed Chinese takeover of very large Australian mining companies to the chagrin of uh, Beijing at the time. But we've now seen uh, where our responsibilities lie and through a series of uh, private and investments, some of which are supported by the uh, subsidy arrangements under the Inflation Reduction Act of the United States Congress and from, it's my wife. It's, uh, <laughs> word to the wise, never pick up the phone under those circumstances and say, I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> Just pretend you're not there, okay? <laughs> so we cut that out of the video later on. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, oh my God, I've now torpedoed my own line of logic. Anyway, <laughs> is that uh, through a series of other investments, part of them supported by uh, subsidy arrangements uh, from this country and some prospectively from ours. By 2027, we should have relocated about 20 to 25% of the world's lithium processing to Australia. Um, so we are acting strategically, but here lies the question. The world, the European Union, Japan, elsewhere, uh, want to have secure long-term access to the full spectrum of critical minerals, which feeds its way into so many critical items of uh, machinery, and technology that we use around the world. At present, the Chinese have effectively, through national subsidies, uh, created an artificial price in global markets in most of these categories of processed critical minerals. So therefore, in counter-industrial policy, who then invests to cover the difference? 
Is it the end user, for example, a German car manufacturer? Uh, is it the supplier, uh, namely us or our governments? Or is it the private company? But can a private company developing said mine or processing facility uh, rely upon the end user to say, oh, I'm putting my hand on my heart and I'm definitely not going to buy any of that heavily subsidised Chinese processed product in the future? I don't know about the patriotism of American firms, but sometimes other firms around the world choose to go with the lowest price. So that is the machinery of the dilemma we are seeking to deal with now. That's as blunt as I can be in response. Other than to say, it's all fine and dandy, we've got it under control. Hello, thank you so much for being here today. I'm Cameron McPherson, I'm a junior scholar. Um, and I, as soon as we end our time here with you, we are headed to an annual event that we do with our soldiers every year, um, where we do mock negotiations uh, between different countries. And so I was just wondering if you have any advice for us novices. Mock negotiations. I've got to say, I've only ever done real ones. Uh, <laughs> and, the, uh, and sitting down across the table from uh, Hu Jintao and uh, Xi Jinping, and dealing with uh, some of the questions which we've been touching on today, although it's been some years since I've been in office. I think the important, um, if you're talking about um, uh, how to engage in a negotiation, it is often assumed uh, that negotiation is about deception. I don't buy that, uh, because most of the folks that you're dealing with are grown-ups. They haven't got to where they've got to in their respective countries because um, they are a bunch of klutzes. That's not the case. So there's often an assumption that I see in some of the corporate training manuals across the world that all you've got to be is cleverer in your deception uh, in dealing with your counterpart. I do not hold that view. There is uh, a separate set of questions which is about uh, how you stage the playing of your hand so long as that doesn't involve deception. And the reason I say this again is because deception creates a sense of bad faith on the part of your interlocutor, which then lasts and causes them to form a character judgment about you as the other negotiator. So staging your hand is one thing, uh, but being deceptive uh, about a key point of fact uh, will not assist you in securing the outcome that you want or, frankly, its stickability afterwards if the other party assume that they've been led up the garden path uh, by you. The third point I'd simply make is, however adversarial your uh, negotiating counterpart may be, let's just say you're with Vladimir Putin tomorrow, okay? I hope you've got insurance. The, um, <laughs> the, um, um, and don't take any private jets anywhere. It uh, could end badly. Not that I'm making any accusations. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, but uh, having a firm view of the other side in terms of what animates their interests, what constitutes their values, and how bad they may have been in the past, it is always important to be professional by which I mean not to regard to engage in ad hominem. That is, to engage in forms of smaller or larger personal abuse. Uh, being professional, firm, and even friendly uh, and courteous will actually take you a long way in terms of securing an outcome. Uh, back before uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine the first time, um, the, uh, I had spent a bit of time uh, with, uh, with Russians. And even after the first Ukrainian invasion, when they took Crimea, uh, as a think tanker, uh, as head of the Asia Society in New York, uh, for some years I would go back to uh, Moscow, to Petersburg, and Vladivostok. In fact, would uh, chair seminars like this with folks on stage, uh, including Vladimir Putin, Shinzo Abe, and others. The standard refrain on the part of some in the Russian system, for example, not all, but some, and this may be diminishing, but I think it's a useful insight is, quote, the conduct of this official was very professional, unquote. That is, that they were engaged in the simple business of courtesy, consistency, effectiveness, and non-deception. 
And that can be helpful, even when you're dealing with such a difficult set of negotiators uh, as the Russians. I have no naivety at all about what you're dealing with on the other side. But if the object of the exercise is to secure the optimal outcome from the negotiation, that would be my one, two, or three points of advice. And occasionally evidence a bit of a sense of humor. Um, a lot of these negotiations are like attending a, a morgue, and, uh, <laughs> which um, is not the happiest of places in my experience. Uh, so um, uh, I used to work in a hospital as a kid funding my way through the universities. Uh, so um, um, occasionally lightening up the table and showing a little bit of personality rather than just being an automaton. There you go. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you for being with us today, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Elena Bagdasarian, and I'm a senior scholar majoring in public health and political science. So I kind of just wanted to ask about your role within the National Health Reform Agreement um, in the world of public health. It's something that you know we've kind of studied a lot. And so I was wondering, considering Australia is considered a um, a closer case study to the U.S. healthcare system, has the U.S. reached out about any advice regarding healthcare reform? And considering now that the National Healthcare Reform Agreement is in its 2020 to 2025 stage, how has the implementation of the reform been throughout your various positions? Okay, well, that's a good non-foreign policy, security policy question. As Prime Minister of the country, you uh, are required to uh, be a jack of all trades. Um, and certainly as Prime Minister, because uh, I uh, took uh, national health reform as fundamentally important for all working families right across our country. Um, it was something which um, I attached a lot of time and resources to. I chaired the National Health and Hospitals Reform Commission in Australia and undertook, frankly, a three-month nationwide tour of uh, some 40 or 50 of our hospitals um, and engaged with colleges of specialists, uh, colleges of general practitioners, uh, colleges of nursing and uh, the other allied health professions. Why it's important for our democracies is that here in the United States, all our democracies, having an effective health system is so fundamental for preserving the social contract. And if the social contract is preserved, our national stability is enhanced. And as that is enhanced, then our ability to act as effective uh, agents in the world is underscored as well. So together with our education systems, our health systems, uh, as well as what I describe more broadly as our income support systems, including our retirement income systems. You get these three things right, it provides so much ballast in our democracies to preserve our social contracts to enable us to be good actors in the world on a continuing basis. Second point I'd make is um, that um, in the United States, because you've made a series of historical decisions, last time I looked you were expending something like 19% of GDP uh, on uh, health and hospitals. That's a truckload of cash that you guys spend. Last time I looked, and you should check whether I'm wrong or right, we spend about 9% of GDP on the same. Maybe now 10, because uh, I'm a little dated in my figures. We haven't lend landed nirvana, but we represent a system which is, if you've got British and Canadian uh, uh, universal health care over here, and you have US private health care over here, augmented by Medicare and Medicaid, we're kind of here, where we have a system which is 70% public, 30% private, uh, and with universal access for everybody uh, through a universal health insurance scheme. But you can also privately health insure if you've got sufficient disposable income to do so, and without political penalty for it, that is, as a Labor Prime Minister of Australia, which is like being a Democrat President of the United States, um, I would proudly say I am privately health insured. Why? Because I've got sufficient income to privately insure. What does that mean? I would therefore, if I needed, or my family needed, would go to a private hospital and have access there. Um, but at the same time, it meant that everyone who is relying exclusively on the universal public system would also have immediate access in the case of emergency, emergency medicine but with some longer waiting time for uh, non-urgent medical care. So, is it perfect? No. But um, I would say that if you put it together 
and you A, achieve an appropriate funding balance between the federal and state governments, which is what we brought it in as 50-50 share between Canberra and the states. B, have a system which links hospital-based care, which is acute, preventative health care, which is designed to stop people going to hospital, community-based care, which is designed to stop people going to hospital, um, but in fact deal with uh, ailments in the community, general practitioners in the community, again with the object of stopping people getting to hospitals, and then post-acute care to get them out of hospitals as soon as possible, as well as integrated age care so that when you've got um, a geriatric care that it's probably attended to as well. The whole reason was to reduce the stress on the hospital system because it is the single biggest piece of expenditure you've got and also arguably only effective when you're dealing with acute conditions. Hospitals are notorious for infections, for example. Uh, so therefore, we've designed or sought to design this integrated uh, national uh, health and hospitals reform uh, agreement which integrates these various arms of, uh, of national health care but underpinning it with a private public funding mix. And the final element of the equation is we've also introduced what we call a hospital funding agreement which is based on activity within hospitals rather than just a block grant. Uh, so that you're not just given a block of money for the sake of it, it is activity based funding uh, in terms of what is a defined set of surgical procedures which could be undertaken within a hospital over a given period of time. To prevent hospitals from gaming the system one way or the other. In the implementation a decade along, because we're a democracy, um, I came second in our 2013 elections. That means I lost. Okay. So, um, uh, and the subsequent Conservative Government of Australia unwound some, but not all, of what I sought to do. Today, what state it's in? Reasonable. Uh, not brilliant, but reasonable. And I think more sustainable than what we see with universal public systems. Uh, in uh, other parts of the world. Look at the British National Health System, for example, uh, the NHS. It's under massive stress, massive stress, because it's so hard to fund these things effectively in providing universal insurance for everybody in every category of need. A hybrid, I think, is the way to go. But getting the dynamics of the hybrid right is where the art and the science lie. Thank you for the question. Well, thank you so much for spending the morning with us, Ambassador Rudd. I think I speak on behalf of everybody um, when I say we've really appreciated your visit to Louisville. Um, if we could just get another round of applause for the Ambassador. By the way, um, if any of you are interested, I'm going to leave this with your Senate Director. Uh, as a think tank, I finished this last year. And uh, it's a book on the avoidable war. It seeks to describe Xi Jinping's worldview seeks to describe what's the shape of possible conflict scenarios uh, with, uh, between China and the United States. It seeks to define a way through, uh, hence the term avoidable war. Uh, my friend and colleague at Harvard University wrote the book Destined for War, Thucydides' Trap, that's Graham Allison, and uh, we we're in Harvard together actually. So he wrote that one, I wrote this one. Uh, we largely agree, uh, but his publishers thought his title would sell better than mine. And they were right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ambassador, as a tradition um, here with all of our distinguished speakers, we'd like to ask you to do us the honor of signing a Louisville Slugger bat. Hey, hey, that's great. So here's the answer. I was going to wonder, how do I take that on the plane? But it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I saw the Sluggers field last night. So are these, who, who backs the Sluggers here? Only one of you. My God. The, uh, who, are the other, who are the other teams here? Is this this giant bat I saw in town on Main Street? Yeah. That's pretty impressive. How does anyone build a bat that big? <laughs> is it by fiberglass or what? It's just huge. It's yeah. Is it actually made of wood? It's made of wood. <laughs> it's made of wood. Yeah. My God. That's serious amount of timber there. <laughs> the, uh, so this is fun. I played wiffle ball. And, uh, <laughs> but if, you're, um, you know, if you're like this, is that kind of how you hold it? Yeah. <laughs> So what I'm used to is this, you know, which is, and uh, so if wiffle ball is really hard because we just don't have any eye-hand coordination for swiping in the middle of the air. <laughs> we can only do it kind of that way. So uh, 
If I fail miserably at wiffle ball, but this should improve my game. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, folks.